Let's go. All right, welcome everybody. Um, I'm Robin Laurie Meyerkoff, and I just wanted to give you a little bit of background on myself so you know where I'm coming from. Um, I was a regular ed classroom teacher for 20, 25 years, and I decided to take a year off when my own kids were in middle school, and I did the year-long um, ASD graduate credit course at Antioch University. Um, it's a one-year graduate course that was really terrific. Um, if anybody wants any information about that course, uh, you can let Elia know and she can give you my contact information. I can tell you about it. But that sent me off in a different direction and I decided not to go into the classroom, back to the classroom, and I decided that I wanted to become a consultant. And this was way back in the uh, dinosaur ages of 2004-2005 when Asperger's and ASD and high-functioning autism were still kind of newish terms. And so um, I consulted to schools and families. I ran a parent support group and my special interest was social skills groups and I ran social skills groups for about five or six years. Um, later on, um, I was also a volunteer at AAME for New Hampshire, and so later on, um, I applied for the uh, associate director job at AAME and did that for about five years. And the I live in New Hampshire, and the commute from New Hampshire to Watertown got a little tedious for me, so um, we decided to part ways. Though I have a good relationship with AAME, and um, I do my own consulting now. I run workshops through UNH Continuing Ed. I do the webinars um, from AANE. I've helped Elia out with the um, summer education educators programming, and um, I'm also a coach through Life Map, and I have some young adults that I coach with that transition from after high school, what's next. So um, I welcome you today, and I'm really excited about this training. I have a passion for people working with people with Asperger's, and especially on this transition to life after high school, because what we know about children is that they grow up, and that kids with Asperger's or ASD grow up to be adults with Asperger's or ASD, and um, the supports are not quite the same. The, the supports that you're seeing if you have kids in elementary, middle, or high school are quite different when they get to college and beyond. And so um, I'm going to help navigate that transition for you. What I'd first like to do, though, is show a video. As many of you can see, or hopefully all of you can see, is the picture of the Big Bang Theory. And that's, you know, a lot of us, it's one of our favorite shows because it's full of quirky characters. And uh, maybe one or two could be diagnosed with Asperger's or ASD. And what I'd like to do is I'd like to show you a little video that really highlights the, um, the difficulty in having social relationships and being socially appropriate. Um, with our population. I'll just set this video up for you. Um, Sheldon, who's the gentleman on the left with the dinosaur t-shirt, in case you don't know, he um, would like to be friends with this man, Krepke, who is at his workplace, which is a university. Well, Krepke got a big grant, and Sheldon would like to be part of that grant, but him and Krepke haven't always gotten along. So um, Sheldon goes to a bookstore to find some information on uh, developing friendships. And most of the books are in the children's department. So um, we will watch this clip and see what ensues, and then I have some things for you to think about. Just in time. I believe I've isolated the algorithm for making friends. Sheldon, there is no algorithm for making friends. Well, we'll hear him out. If he's really onto something, we could open a booth at Comic Con, make a fortune. See, my initial approach to Kripke had the same deficiencies as those that played Stew the Cockatoo when he was new at the zoo. Stew the Cockatoo? Yes. He's new at the zoo. It's a terrific book. I've distilled its essence into a simple flow chart that will guide me through the process. Have you thought about putting him in a crate while you're out of the apartment? 
said, hello, Kripke. Yeah, Sheldon Cooper here. It occurred to me that you hadn't returned any of my calls because I hadn't offered any concrete suggestions for pursuing our friendship. Yeah, perhaps the two of us might share a meal together. Yeah, I see. Well, then perhaps you'd have time for a hot beverage. <laughs> Popular choices include tea, coffee, cocoa. I see. No, 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 wait, don't hang up yet. But what about a recreational activity? I bet we share some common interests. You tell me an interest of yours. You, really? On actual horses? <laughs> tell me another interest of yours. Oh, no, I'm sorry. I have no desire to get in the water till I absolutely have to. Tell me another interest of yours. Uh-oh, he's stuck in an infinite loop. I can fix it. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. It's interesting, but isn't ventriloquism by definition a solo activity? <laughs> yeah. Wait, tell me another interest of yours. Hmm. Is there any chance you like monkeys? <laughs> yeah, what is wrong with you? Everybody likes monkeys. <laughs> Hang on, Kripke. A loop counter and an escape to the least objectionable activity. Howard, that's brilliant. I'm surprised you saw that. <laughs> Gee, why can't Sheldon make friends? <laughs> All right, Kripke, that last interest strikes me as the least objectionable, and I would like to propose that we do that together tomorrow. Yes, I'll pay. <laughs> All right, goodbye. All right. Time to learn rock climbing. <laughs>
uh, before we go to college. Well, what we know is the K through 12 eligibility for getting assistance if you have a diagnosis is that um, it is up to the school to make sure that the student is successful. And it's up to the school to come up with the accommodations and the support through an IEP or a 504 that the student is getting the support that they need. So here it says school districts must serve any child with a disability who needs special education and related services, even though the child has not failed or been retained in a course or grade and is advancing from grade to grade. So in high school, to be eligible for spe special education, the child must have a, a, a learning disability or a disability of, of some sort. Um, if the child has a disability but doesn't need special education services, they might be eligible for 504. The purposes of the 504 is to help children with disabilities um, get the education and the services that they need so they can be successful in high school and beyond. Well, the eligibility and legal standards for college are a little bit different because we have to remember that college is not a legal right for our population. It's privilege. And so just because your student has a diagnosis or your child has a diagnosis, it does not guarantee that they have a disability. Diagnosis does not um, mean that they have a disability. And what I mean by that is if a child has a diagnosis and they're doing fine in school and they um, get good grades and they're moving along, they get, um, they get promoted every year and they seem to be doing okay, then that isn't something that needs support and accommodation. So we have to be careful that just because you're child has a diagnosis or your student has a diagnosis, we need to be very clear on what the accommodations and support that they need in college are. One of the things that's very important to understand for college is that documentation is necessary. So say your um, child got a diagnosis in third grade but has been in on a 504, hasn't had an IEP, and really hasn't had another evaluation since then because things have been going okay, but you're nervous and you want them to have some support in college. Well, it's time to renew that um, either psychological evaluation or neuropsych evaluation because the um, colleges require that you need to have a, a neuropsych or a psychology exam within three years of attending college. It must be current. The other thing that's very important, this is very hard for parents, is that the students must self-identify. And what I mean by that is the student needs to go to the Office of Disabilities and fill out the paperwork if they would like to get some level of service. That's not to say you can't go with them, but you cannot call the Office of Disabilities or Student Services, whatever they call the office. Um, you cannot go in and fill out the paperwork for your child. They need to do it themselves. Once a student is 18, they are considered an adult unless you've done some legal sorts of um, um, paperwork and, um, and your student isn't um, making all their own decisions until, say, 21. But most of the time when the student's 18, they are considered an adult and they must register with the Office of Disabilities or Student Services themselves. Now, say that your student or your child has registered and there's a list of accommodations that they will be receiving. Having the accommodations does not guarantee success. There's a lot that goes into those accommodations being successful and mostly that is the student having the ability to self-advocate and that's a big part of college is that self-advocacy and I talk a lot to parents and I know AA&E does as well about self-understanding and self-advocacy. Those are probably the two biggest things that our students need to be successful after high school. And the other thing that needs to be proven is that evidence that the disability is limiting access to learning. 
there needs to be some proof that um, your student or your child that their disability um, keeps them from engaging in the curriculum fully. So that's how college and um, elementary, middle, and high school are different. So Wright's Law, a lot of you have heard of Wright's Law, and Wright's Law is, is excellent, um, and it works very good for elementary, middle, and high school students. And it says the ultimate responsibility for providing transition services rests with the school district or state education agency if the district fails, and there is no provision for a waiver of this requirement. So if you have a high school student right now, having a good transition plan is absolutely key, and we're going to talk about transition plans a little bit later. Now remember, once your student gets to college, they do not have an IEP or a 504. Even if your school is telling you, oh, well, don't worry about college, the IEP will follow him or her, that is incorrect information. IDEA comes from the U.S. Department of Education, and it says, unlike your high school, however, your post-secondary school is not required to provide FAPE. Um, rather, your post-secondary school is required to provide appropriate academic adjustments as necessary to ensure that it does not discriminate on the basis of a disability. IDEA is based on disability services. What's your disability and what are the accommodations that you need to be successful? So what do colleges offer for support? What I'd like everybody to do, you don't necessarily have to write this down if you, if you want to write it down to help you, but I, what I want you to do is take a minute or two and think about what may be offered for support at the college level for students um, on the autism spectrum. And just for clarification here, I do tend to use um, the word Asperger's quite a bit because many of the people that I know that were diagnosed before this current DSM went into effect um, consider themselves having Asperger's. And so I know that everybody now is ASD, but there are many people in the community who still do use the term Asperger's. Okay, so you have thought for a couple of minutes of what you think the support is offered for the college level. So what do colleges offer for support? Well, there's usually a um, student support services or disabilities office or some sort of office that is staffed um, and is open the regular college hours. And within that office, students need to reg register if they want to um, receive any sorts of accommodations. There's counseling and mental health services, and that's available to everyone on campus, not specifically to people with uh, disabilities. Um, so there's always counseling and mental health. A lot of times these places are open 24 hours a day, so if you feel your, your child is having some sort of emergency or they feel like they're having an emergency, oftentimes you can access these things 24 hours a day. Um, if your student or child is on medication, oftentimes they can fill their meds at the mental health center. There's, stu there's study centers. Um, many, many colleges nowadays have math or writing labs, but many other universities and college, uh, colleges offer, also offer science labs or um, foreign language labs, anything that, any type of study center that's going to help kids learn and be successful. These are also open to all the students. You do not need to have a disability in order to access any of the student study centers. There's assistive technology, and that assistive technology is going to be different for different students, but um, maybe your student or child are going to get their um, notes emailed to them, or maybe they're going to have access to the PowerPoint from the professor ahead of time. So those are, those are small things that the college can do very easily as long as it's appropriate and it's something that's um, going to help your student be successful. 
There's access accessibility to classes and professors. So if somebody's in a wheelchair or on crutches or blind, they have to have um, accessibility to the classes and the professors. The other uh, thing is that professors usually have office hours that are posted and that they are available for students regularly to discuss uh, matters. There's alternative testing if your student or your child needs a quiet place to take testing or if they need a longer period of time to take testing. That is certainly allowable at many of our colleges and universities. And the, and the other thing is that there might be some alternative housing op options. Some of our uh, universities and colleges now are often offering quiet dorms, and these are often dorms where the kids are very studious and that lights are out at a certain time instead of, you know, what we think of colleges, you know, party central. There's also, if your student is very musical, there's sometimes musical dorms. Um, there's kosher dorms. There's all kinds of alternative housing available if your student or child um, is looking for something like that. So some of the things that colleges don't offer. So they're not going to test and they're not going to diagnose. You need to come in with a diagnosis and like I said earlier, you need to come in with um, some testing that's been done with done within three years. If it's over three years, your student or child may not be eligible for services within the uh, disability offices. Um, they don't offer um, initiation of eligibility of services. There's no sorts of uh, things that they will do to, to ensure that your student will get what they need. It's up to you as a family to make sure that all of the information is clear and um, is able to be um, um, looked at and disseminated by the support services organization. Um, not necessarily communication with families or high school personnel. They do not have to do that. Many schools will communicate with families and will communicate with high school personnel during that transition phase, but they are not obligated to. And that's really um, heartbreaking for many families. I have um, a parent that um, I worked with a few years ago who her son seemed to be falling apart. It was April, school was ending in May, and she was calling the Office of Disabilities to get some information. Was he going to class? Was he passing things in? And the school could not communicate with her. They, they encouraged her to talk with her son and encouraged her son to come into the um, student services office. Well, um, her son wasn't listening to her for whatever reason. This happens with our with our students. You know, they don't want to listen to mom and dad. They want to do it themselves. And he ended up flunking out. And um, it wasn't anybody's fault per se, but the the school is not obligated to take your phone calls. Well, they can take your phone calls, but they're not obligated to follow through, to find the student, to make sure he's going to class, to make sure he's taking care of himself. Is he getting along with their, his roommates? That's really not their responsibility. Um, they don't offer IEPs, individual education plans, or 504s. They do offer that IDEA, what I talked about earlier. Um, many, many, many times there is is no reduced workload or requirements. You are paying for college, just like everybody else who is going to college. And if there's a syllabus or there's requirements, that's for everybody. That doesn't mean that you can't have longer times or that the professor um, might give you some alternatives to taking notes, but the workload and the requirements very, very, very often may not be decreased at all. So we need to make sure that our students are ready for the rigors of college before we send them off. And the other thing that they're not going to offer is they're not going to offer um, aids or tutors or personal assistance of any, any kind. There are some places where you can hire a coach for your student, and AA&E does some um, college coaching through their Life Map program, but that is strictly outside of class. That is not during the class time. Because if you think about it, um, people are paying to attend these classes. If your student gets an aid or a personal tutor that comes to class with them and they're not paying tuition, that doesn't really work out well for the college. So all of that can be done 
outside of class time. So here's a sample of an accommodation for um, a typical college student. Modifications may include changes in the length of time permitted for the completion of degree requirements, substitution of specific courses required for the completion of degree requirements, and adaptation of the manner in which specific courses are conducted. So those are things that many colleges and universities may be able to do. So what this means is it may take longer than four years to get a degree, which is fine. So maybe you're going to take, um, your student's going to take three classes instead of four, or four classes instead of five, so it's going to take them a little longer. Maybe um, they're going, not going to have to take every single course. Maybe if a language is required, you might be able to figure out a way to get something in its place if your student isn't going to be able to hang handle a language requirement. Each u university and college is different. And then um, the adaptation and the manner of specific courses are conducted. So just meaning that if your student has difficulty taking notes, maybe they'll be able to tape the lecture, maybe they'll be able to get the notes um, handed to them written by somebody else, or maybe the PowerPoint from the professor. So those are all things that would be in the normal course of a university or college accommodations. So let's talk a little bit about the profile of our ASD students and how are they different from their peers who are attending college? Because a lot of people might say in this day and age, you know, nobody's prepared for college. You know, my kid doesn't have a disability and he almost flunked out first semester. And that's very true. Many of our students aren't prepared for college. But our students are, in a particular way have difficulty with that transition from high school to college. So let's talk a little bit about their profile characteristics. So we know that many of our students have low eye contact and when there's low eye contact that can seem a little bit rude to professors or other students or um, it may seem snobbish or um, there may be some misunderstanding there with with um, people who don't make eye contact. Many of our students have very quick speech or very slow speech. Some of our kids speak really, really fast. And it's hard to understand exactly what they're saying. But on the other end, many of our students have trouble processing information. And so when somebody asks them a question, they may not answer the question right away. It may take them a little bit longer to process the information and then answer. Misunderstandings in the intentions of others, that's a big one. Um, and then the opposite is also true, is other people also misunderstand their intentions. And this happens a lot. This is one of those things where um, our ASD students want things to be black and white, and oftentimes they are not black and white, and it can lead to misunderstandings. What we do know is that many, many of our ASD students are highly intelligent. Many of them have very high IQs and are going to um, outstanding colleges that, um, that notice and reward their intelligence. But having an intelligence about um, subjects is different than having a social intelligence and that's what's often missing with our kids. And so even though they're very smart and highly intelligent, they like to do what they like to do and have difficulty doing things that are not interesting to them. Which can be difficult in college because oftentimes the first year or maybe even the first two years, students are taking classes that are considered core classes, not necessarily in their major. And many of our students have difficulty in that first year or two because they're not taking anything of their particular interest that's going to be their major. So for me, if you have a student or a child with that type of profile, you may want to look at a college that they start their major in when they're freshmen. A lot of our colleges now and universities are starting right away when the kids are freshmen in their major and scattering the core requirements out through the whole four years. So maybe you're going to take one or two classes a semester that's a core instead of all of your classes being core, um, which is a little bit different. So knowing who the information, knowing your child or your student so they apply to and get accepted and go to the correct college. We know that transition issues are difficult for our students. The, 
and I'm talking about the big transition, so going from middle school to high school, from high school to college, from college to work, those big transitions, but even the small small transitions. So getting up in the morning, getting ready on time, getting ready for classes, all of those things are transitions and can be difficult for many of our students. So understanding that your student or child should have a good handle on these small transitions before we ship them off to college. We also know that emotional regulation can be difficult for many of our um, ASD students, that they have emotional outbursts, they get very upset when people misunderstand them, or um, they're not getting their point across, or they're having sensory issues. So just understanding that um, in order to go to college and be successful, your emotional regulation difficulties should be um, regulated. You should be able to have some emotional regulation strategies. We know there are social difficulties. There are social difficulties with, um, with understandings. There are social difficulties with members of the opposite sex. There are social difficulties in having um, many of our students have things that they like to do in a way that they like to do them and a time that they like to do them that might not match up with their roommate if they are going to have a roommate or with their dorm. So just making sure that um, your, your student is ready to go off to college and understanding some of these social difficulties. Not that they have to be overcome, but just having an understanding that everybody isn't going to be just like you and want to do everything at the same time that you want to do them. Sensory issues, we know that for some of our students, sensory issues can be overwhelming. What type of strategies does your student have to calm themselves down to, so that they're not overwhelmed by sensory issues? Really getting some strategies in place for emotional regulation, for sensory issues, for when things aren't going well is really important if your student or child is going off to college. Time management difficulties, that can be a huge problem. That's that whole executive function. And so getting to class on time, passing things in on time. I will tell you that with a lot of universities and colleges, there is no wiggle room. And so oftentimes our kids in high school, well, they, you can take another day or two to finish that project. Or you can come to class five minutes late. I understand that, you know, there's a lot going on in the hallway. Well, for some of our universities and colleges, absolutely not. If, if the class starts at 8.20 and you're not there at 8.20, you may not be able to get in. Um, if a project is due on a certain date, it's due on that certain date and there's no wiggle room. So finding out about these things of particular colleges is important if your student has some time management difficulties. Or um, I like to start working on many of these issues, but time management in particular when our students are young teens, 12, 13, 14 years old, start working on time management issues. And then another one is that overwhelming people with um, tidbits, facts, conversation about their special interest. Oftentimes the special interest is not something that is overwhelming to other people and they don't want to hear about it 24-7. So being able to listen to other people's conversations or stop your conversation about whatever your special interest is, the solar system, magic cards, um, whatever. The only one, I will have a caveat here, if your student or child is obsessed with like the Red Sox or the Patriots and talks about them ad nauseum, that may be okay because it seems like a lot of people in New England talk about the sports teams quite a bit. So that's the one special interest when I hear that a kid is obsessed with the Red Sox, I'm always like, yes, because you can stop anybody in any um, street in New England and start having a conversation about the Red Sox and you'd probably be able to have a pretty good conversation. So besides that though, overwhelming people with your special interest can be um, uh, can be socially inappropriate. So what we do know is that when presented with information in a clear, specific, and visual way, our students may respond positively. So having your student or your child learn to self-advocate when things aren't specific enough, 
when things aren't clear enough, if they need visuals to go along with the oral presentations, they need to advocate for this. You can advocate in the um, Office of Disabilities and you can also advocate with specific professors as well. Um, this is from AANE. Many of you might have seen this before. It's called AS the Big Picture. And the reason I like to show this visual is so people can have an understanding of how complicated and difficult social competency is. If you look at this, it shows you that in order to have social competency, there's lots of factors. We want our students to have flexible thinking. They need to understand generalization. They need to have some level of executive function skills, so learning how to problem solve, that time management that I talked about earlier. We want them to be able to, if not fully, but at least partly understand perspective taking, that other people are thinking different thoughts from you, and that's okay. There's also the hidden curriculum, the unwritten social rules that we talk about a lot. Oftentimes, that is, our, our students are completely oblivious to that. And understanding that there is a hidden curriculum out there. I'm not saying that we need to teach all the hidden curriculum out there because it changes all the time, but that there is a hidden curriculum out there. Um, the pragmatics, that communication, um, that the give and take and the flow of conversation that can be very difficult for our students. So just making sure that they um, understand a bit about how to have a conversation. And the, the bigger ones, the self-awareness and self-advocacy, those are huge. So um, I think that really having students understand who they are, what their strengths and challenges are, and how to advocate for themselves really is key to success, not only in college, but really in life. And then if we look about, um, look at the bottom, that's, those, that's the bedrock of social competency, that learning that your um, emotions and anxiety need to be regulated, that if you have attention and impulse control issues, how do you deal with them, what do you do, and then that sensory regulation that I talked about earlier. So um, I just want you to look at this for a minute because there's a lot going on there just to understand how um, complicated social competency is. So how do these issues affect college students, okay? And um, maybe maybe your student has some of these issues at high school. I don't know. But um, understanding that um, if you have some annoying behaviors, it may not be um, a way to uh, gain friends and have an understanding professor. So interrupting behavior. Many of our students, they um, are very intelligent, like I said before, and they may know a lot of answers. And so making sure that they understand that if they answer every question and they're interrupting all the time, that it's not going to be looked upon um, positively by the professor or the peers. Difficulty with core subjects, like I said before, some of our students are only interested in what they're interested in and having an understanding that, you know, you don't like writing, you don't like English. Well that may be a core subject that you need to take. Roommate or dorm issues, so choosing the right dorm. Maybe your student's going to have a single the first year, or maybe they're going to go to community college for the first couple of years and then go to um, college. But understanding that if you do go to college, there's ch the chance you could have a roommate and um, there are you know, some dorm issues that your student or child may not be comfortable with. Handing work in on time. That's huge. There's often not a lot of wiggle room there in colleges. Difficulties contacting professors or disability services when help is needed. Sometimes our students are um, not on the same wavelength with everybody else, and so it might be 7 o'clock at night and they're having difficulty with their homework, and they go to the um, professor's office thinking that they're going to be there to help them. And 
not understanding that a professor has office hours. You often need to make an appointment. Same thing with disability services. They may have certain hours. You may need to make an appointment if you speak to somebody just because you're having a problem right there and then. There may not be anybody around to help you. So understanding that there are certain times where help is available. Misunderstanding grading or the big picture on grades. Many of our kids, like I've said a few times, are very smart and very capable and very intelligent. But if they do not participate at all in class, or if they participate so much that it's annoying, that may affect their grade. So being aware of these things. Isolation issues. Um, many of our kids do self-isolate because the other kids drive them crazy or they've just had enough and they can't handle anymore and other students might um, consider that kind of behavior odd. If your student has eating or food issues, if they're going to go off to college, um, are they going to be able to eat in the cafeteria or the dining commons? Um, if not, are they going to take the food to go and just eat in their room all the time? That's that's back to the one in front, isolating issues. So um, when you do visit colleges, I would suggest visiting the dining commons as well and making sure that your, your child or your student um, could be comfortable there because I think a lot of um, social activity happens in the dining commons. And what else? I'm sure there's many other issues as well. Maybe if you want to, you can write down a few of these issues and we can talk about them at the end. So, some of the planning. I can't stress enough to start visiting colleges early. Many, many, many families and students, typical, um, start visiting in the summer between the junior and the senior year. That's very typical to start um, visiting colleges, or maybe the spring of the junior year. Let's start visiting colleges. I suggest especially if you have an older sibling in the house and you're going to be going to colleges anyways, bring along your ASD student. I suggest visiting colleges early and often so your student can get an understanding of the real flavor of different colleges. Maybe you're going to go away for a weekend. Maybe pick, pick a college community to go visit for a weekend and make it like a fun family um, event. College towns can have a lot going on. It can be really interesting, so that might be a fun thing to do. I suggest visiting colleges of different sizes, small, medium, and large campuses. Um, a lot of parents I talk to assume that a small college is going to be the way to go because a small college is going to be intimate, your kid's not going to get lost in the shuffle, and it's going to be much more, um, it, it's going to have much more advantage to help your kid be successful. That's not always true. Our large campuses often have a lot of accommodations, they have a lot of different interests, a lot of different students, and so it might be easier for your child to find other students to um, be interested in and strike up friendships with at a larger campus versus a small campus. So I just encourage people to visit all types of campuses. Um, and then find some information on colleges that work successfully with AS students. I know that um, um, Lori Wolf and um, Jane Theerfield Brown have a website, and they have a website with information on different colleges. And so find out, you know, maybe there's some colleges that you would never even thought of and wouldn't even be on your radar, radar to check out that work successfully for students on the autism spectrum. Can your student take college classes in high school? So like what I said earlier, so maybe it's going to take longer for your student to go to college. They're not going to be able to graduate in four years. It's going to be too stressful. So maybe if they can take a couple of classes in high school, that's going to help speed up the process a little bit and they won't be too far behind when they um, attend college. I think visiting community colleges is fantastic. There's a lot of great community colleges in our area. And um, if Obama gets his way, the first year or two of community college might be free or a very low cost. So that might be something to um, take a look at. When you do visit colleges, I suggest making an appointment with the Disability Services Department ahead of time 
So when you do visit the college, you'll have somebody to talk to in the Disability Services Department and find out what kind of accommodations are available. The other thing that I'd like to ask people is, when you're looking at a college, how many people are in the staff at the Disability Services Department? If you have a, a college of 10,000 kids and there's two full-time staff at Disability Services, I would say they're probably stretched pretty thin. But if you're looking at a college of 5,000 kids that has um, four full-time staff people in their Disability Services Department, that might um, bode well for that school. So just something to kind of think about and tuck away in the back of your brain. And then having those kinds of conversations. Is your child going to live at home or away? And if they're going to live away, are they going to have a single or are they going to have roommates? How far away? Do you want to be able to visit your child on a regular basis? Do you want him or her to be able to come home on a regular basis? And then disclosure. We're going to talk a little bit more about disclosure as we go along. But start thinking about before your student goes to college about disclosure. Fostering independence. Um, these are all things that I feel should be done in high school. Oftentimes it's difficult because our kids are so overwhelmed with all the work and maybe their special interests, there's no time. But I really encourage families to um, do some or all of these things in high school to start understanding that um, the ability to work socially appropriately with peers and with other people. So joining clubs or groups or organizations, is there something at the school that your um, child or student will attend? If there's not anything at the school, is there a um, community rec center or is there a church group? Is there something that your um, student will join to be a part of? Um, one of the things that I've seen be successful, and this is a little bit outside the box, is I know some um, high school students who join these neighborhood card clubs where they play Dungeons and Dragons or Magic Cards, and um, they go in every Friday night or every Sunday night or whatever, but it gives them a community of people to hang out with and learn to start developing, developing friendship skills. Job shadowing is do you know somebody that has a, a company or a small business where your child could job shadow? Could that job shadowing eventually lead to a job? What about volunteering? Does your student have a special interest? And could they volunteer um, because of that special interest? So, so for example, if you have a child or student who's really into dogs or cats, could they volunteer at the local Humane Society? Um, you know, something like that. Or if you have a student that's really into cooking or baking, could they volunteer at the, um, the local bakery or um, a local shelter where they need some help with cooking? Um, internships. Using the interests to develop a plan and could the internship eventually lead, for, lead to a job? What we know nowadays about students in high school and college is almost everybody has an internship before they graduate college. Almost everyone. And so finding the right internship for your student is very important. And then talking about job versus career. Now many of our students because of their high intelligence want a career in a certain area. And they're very focused on having a career. But sometimes, as we all know, it's okay to have a job to pay the bills while you're trying to get a career going. How many of us have had jobs in our lives because we had to pay the bills? And it weren't, wasn't necessarily in our career, but it was a job. And so our students and our children need to understand that there's a difference between having a career and having a job. And sometimes it's okay to have a job and that the career will come later. So um, some things before our uh, students go off to college. I suggest doing some sort of interest inventory, especially for our students that don't have that big, strong special interest or that that special interest isn't something that's going to lead to a major or a job. So what other kinds of things are, is your student interested in? This can be rather difficult. Sometimes our students aren't very forthcoming and it's hard to get um, them to do some sort of interest inventory, but I really uh, think that it's important to 
um, find some sort of way to do this type of inventory before they go off to college. Having away from home experiences, I can't stress this enough either, especially if your student is going off to a four year college. I can't even imagine sending a kid off to college that has never slept away from home ever. I think that would be really um, a difficult transition for a student. So what does the away from home experiences look like? Well, maybe grandma and grandpa live in Florida. So sometime during the high school years, could you send your student to fly down and visit grandma and grandpa for a week or a long weekend? Or do you have a sister or a brother who lives in another state? And they, can they go and visit them for a long weekend or a week? Is there a camp that your um, child would go to for an away from home experience? Is there a big brother or a big sister who's already at college and maybe they could visit them for a weekend? Any sort of away from home experiences that are going to get your child comfortable sleeping in another bed, in another place, um, with different noises, different smells, is going to be helpful. During um, the high school years, deciding whether your student's going to drive or are they going to learn to use public transportation. I'm fine with either one. Many of our ASD folks do not drive. They rely on public transportation. So that may um, help you define what colleges that your student's going to go to because it needs to be near a bus stop. So your student can go to school from your home by bus and that there's going to be good public transportation on the campus as well. If your student is going to drive, making sure that they have a lot of driving experience before they go off to college, especially if they're going to drive at college. Money management. This is huge. This is probably for any students, never mind ASD students, but learning how to manage money and having a debit card in high school with a little bit of money there. Maybe they have a job and they can and um, there's money in their account or maybe they do jobs for you around the house and they earn money but some way of learning how to manage money is extremely important our kids can get into a lot of trouble um, not learning how to manage money finding out some information about colleges before you even apply so if your um, child has never taken a language and isn't very good at language and isn't interested in taking a language at college making sure that you apply to colleges that don't have a language requirement is probably a good idea. Finding out ahead of time for all freshmen what the core classes are, how many, what subjects, can you start taking taking them in your freshman way and take freshman year and take them all the way through four years or do you have to take them all in the first and second year? Those are questions to ask as you're looking at colleges. Does your child have an obsession or special interest? And how do they manage it? Are they up till two in the morning playing on video games? Are they um, having difficulty getting up in the morning because they are engaged with their computer at all hours of the night programming? Making sure before you send your child off to college that they have their special interest under control. They can manage it. Med management. Does your child know what uh, medications they're taking? Do they know why they're taking medications? How are they going to manage these medications? Because what we do know is um, that many of our students do need to take medications, but sometimes those medications um, are highly sought after by others in the college community, so they can sell them or they can take them. So understanding that if your child is on medication, maybe getting some sort of lockbox for the medication, and then how are they going to refill their prescriptions? Are they going to refill them at college? Are you going to refill them? What is going to be the, uh, how are you going to handle that med, med management? And then understanding the diagnosis. Um, I saw this cartoon once a couple of years ago about um, this kid going off to college and the parent, they drop the, they drop the kid off at college and the parents are driving away and they're waving and they're, and they're going, oh, by the way, you have Asperger's syndrome. Um, we want our kids to be their own best self-advocate. In order to do that, they need to understand their diagnosis. 
So making sure that they understand their diagnosis and they're able to advocate successfully. Disclosure. This is a big one. Okay. Now, many of our students are dead sent again against disclosing and registering with the Office of Disabilities. So if you really feel like your student is going to be fine and they're not going to need the Office of Disabilities, fine, then that's okay. But if you feel like at some point your student may get into a little hot water and need some assistance, then registering with the Office of Disabilities is very important. And like I said before, that the student needs to register. Parents cannot. Some Office of Disabilities are better than others. So when you go in your college visits and you're making your appointment at the um, Office of Disabilities and you're talking to somebody, ask them point blank, do you provide information to parents? Some of our Office of Disabilities are better than others. Um, some of them will, with the student present, call a parent and with the student present, give the parents an update. Um, but not everybody will do that. So it's a good idea to get some information. Will your student be disclosing to professors? How will they be disclosing to professors? Will they write up a little um, summary of what their um, strengths and challenges are and give that to every professor? Are they going to work with the Office of Disabilities and the Office of Disabilities is going to disclose to the professors? Um, there's different ways and that can be done and um, finding out if that's something that your child's going to do. Who will the go-to person be? Now, I find that this is important because many of us send our kids off to college. We're all so happy they got into the college of their choice and they're so excited about going. But feelings of depression and anxiousness can really be overwhelming to college students, any college student, not just the kids on the spectrum. And so having a go-to person is really important. Is that go-to person going to be the RA um, on the floor? Is it going to be somebody in the counseling office? Is it going to be somebody in the disabilities office? Maybe you have an aunt or an uncle or a brother who lives in a nearby town. Maybe they're going to be the go-to person. But thinking carefully about making a plan I like to be proactive, not reactive, because if your kid has slipped into a depression um, and is not going to classes and things are falling apart pretty quickly, it's nice to have somebody who you can rely on that can check on them, that they can check in with. Really, um, I, like, I like having that sort of thing. And then the big thing is if your child is adamant on not disclosing, well, what happens when things aren't working? What's the plan? Because what I do know is no disclosure often doesn't work. So I want to talk about classes a little bit. So um, what we do know is that um, full-time students in every university or college, it's a little bit different. So some universities, five classes are considered full-time. In some colleges, Four classes are considered full-time. So finding out how many classes that your student needs today to take to be considered a full-time student. In some schools that I know, um, you can actually take three classes, live in the dorms, and still be considered a full-time student. Because maybe it's a school that has four credit classes. So if you can take three four-credit classes, you still have 12 credits. So finding that information out. Also, when do you decide that you're going to, you know what, as a student, I'm going to stick out this class. I'm going to really work hard, and I'm not doing that well. I'm getting a D or an F right now, but I'm really going to work hard, and I'm going to bring up, bring up my grade. Or, on the other hand, there is usually a deadline where you can drop a class. Now, when you drop a class, that means that you don't get the credits for it, but you, all, but you don't get the grade for it either. So, a lot of students are dropping classes that they feel like are going to bring down their um, cumulative grade quite a lot. If you're flunking a class and it's getting really close to the time whether you need to drop it or not, that should be in the mix and should be considered. How long do you have to bring your grades up if you're doing poorly? And then what about getting a tutor or going to the study centers? 
Is that going to help? These are all things to talk about. Talking to professors, making appointments, keeping appointments. I can imagine it's pretty maddening for professors if your student or your child makes an appointment but then doesn't show up. Time management. Using phones or iPads with apps and alerts is really um, a great help. Uh, so understanding that professors do have office hours that you need to make an appointment. Core classes, the interest level, and the plan for if your student doesn't do well with things that they're not interested in. What is the plan for taking classes that the interest just isn't there? How is your child going to get through that class? The other thing that I really like is having a semester at a glance. So having the whole semester out with every month and then looking and marking where are the holidays, when are the tests, when are the due dates. And so looking at the whole calendar, if you have a kid that's a little bit anxious and wants to come home every once in a while, maybe really making it clear when all the holidays or vacations or days off are so they know that they can come home for those days. And then also maybe uh, creating a weekly calendar that has the short-term dates. So the big semester at a glance is all the long-term stuff, and the weekly calendar is for short-term. Very important to understand. So before attending college, students just should, students should understand their strengths and challenges, like I talked about before, one of the number one things. They should have relaxation or calming routines, things that they do when they're getting stressed. Do they take yoga? Do they go for a walk? Do they play video games? Something that they do that relaxes them and calms them when they're feeling stressed and upset. How does your student study? Do research, write a paper. Um, do they get things done in a reasonable amount of time? Time management, being able to get up and get going without anybody waking you up. That's huge. Many of our students have a very hard time with that. Um, I know students that are you know, 18 years old and in high school and their parents are still waking them up every morning. If you're doing that and you're thinking that your kid's going to go to college and live in a dorm, you better start quickly on learning how to get up by themselves. Passing things in on time, very important. There's often no wiggle room at college. Advocating for yourself. And then being able to understand and um, be aware of when things are not going well. Many of our students, by the time they realize things aren't going well, they're already flunking or they're already in a very... Um, low state of depression. So being able to see along the way when things aren't going well and being able to ask for help. So when we ask for help, who do we go to for help? How do we ask for help? Those are important things that our students need to know before they go off to college. Also some classroom etiquette, that interrupting that I talked about earlier, but making noises. Um, many of our students, you know, maybe they like to eat a snack. Um, during class and they have a chip bag and that chip bag is very very noisy well that can be annoying to other students so making sure that your um, child understands that there's others in the class and that they not exhibit annoying behavior and then also the um, understanding the difference among professors. And that's the same thing in high school. Every high school teacher is a little different. Same thing. Every professor is a little bit different. So what you're allowed to do in one class may not be allowed in another class and being able to understand that. So understanding college and university rights. So the college has a um, right to maintain standards and they have a right to determine the requirements and the standards. Um, they can enforce and maintain codes of conduct and then the regular ADA guidelines. The codes of conduct is, is what I want to focus on for a moment because many of our um, male college students, college ASD students, go off to college and maybe they've never had a relationship with a girl before. And so they may misinterpret things from um, girls that they meet like in the dining commons or in their dorm and they need to make sure that they are not exhibiting any sort of stalking behavior. 
um, so it's it's nice to be noticed and it's nice for the first time in their lives to have girls maybe having conversations with them sitting with them at lunch but not to mis misconstrue that and think that that one that um, person wants to be your girlfriend because maybe they're just being friendly so codes of conduct are huge with this population so the students have some rights too they have equal access to programs of study so anything that they want to study on campus they should be allowed attend and or participate in on-campus activities clubs and organizations they should not be shunned from any of these reasonable and appropriate accommodations and also the ADA guidelines so just making sure that what your child is asking for as far as accommodations and support goes is reasonable the school will probably be able to accommodate you um, I'll just read you this little comic here. It says, life is about compromise. No, it isn't. Yes, it is. Okay, well, maybe sometimes. No, always. So just understanding that some of our kids have difficult with compromise. So some of the college rules for students are, one of the big things is understanding hierarchy. So there's a hierarchy involved in college. If you're having trouble with a professor, you don't go directly to the president of the college and email them about your, the problem with your professor. There's a hierarchy. First you go to professor, then maybe you go to the department head, and then maybe you go to the dean. And so there's a hierarchy involved. And making sure that our student understands that because if they go above somebody's head and they don't talk to um, the professor first, they may be in a lot of trouble. Um, the same thing with roommates and other students. There is a hierarchy. You always approach the roommate or the student first and then find out what the next level is, who you talk to if you're not satisfied. Basic hygiene is of utmost importance for this population. What we do know is this can be very, very difficult for some of our students. But having basic hygiene, especially if you're going to be living in a dorm room with other students. Also, if you don't have basic hygiene, it can be socially isolating. Um, I worked a couple of years ago on an Asperger's um, group up at um, UNH. And there was one student who did not have very good hygiene. And he got very upset because every time he sat down, the other students would stand up and they would leave and we tried to talk to him about that his hair was filthy that he kind of had a smell but he, you know when when it's on your yourself you don't you don't um, you tend not to notice these things and so he he thought it was all about the other students being rude and something needed to be done about them but really it, it was his him his basic hygiene and not being able to take care of himself dating ed etiquette that whole what's what's a friend and then who are the people that I can date understanding the difference because in college the girls may be much more friendly than they were in high school and also that crossing over the line into stalking if you're waiting for a girl after class if you're waiting for her outside of her dorm if you're following her from class to class that might be looked upon as stalking behavior so making sure that you're not exhibiting your child is not exhibiting that type of behavior. Being able to negotiate and compromise a bit, having some flexibility, being able to let go. Okay, well, that person, that professor, that student is not going to agree with me. We can agree to disagree. Many of our students have difficulty with that. If people don't agree with them, they get very upset and they just argue their point stronger. Well, everybody's not going to agree with you in the world. So learning how to be able to either compromise or just let go. Um, some more basic rules. Um, there's going to be peer pressure. And we all know if many of us have been to college and there is a lot of peer pressure that hasn't changed. And if your student is um, uncomfortable with, with much of this, maybe, um, Finding a, a quiet dorm in a university or college might be a good thing. Learning some ways to say no to other students in a socially appropriate manner instead of saying, well, I'm going to call the RA or I'm going to call the police if you do that, which many of our students, they like to be the police of the world. That's not going to win them any friends. So figuring out a way 
figuring a way how to be socially um, appropriate, but letting people know that you're uncomfortable with certain behaviors. Dealing with criticism. Many of our students, because they're very bright and they've breezed through high school, they haven't had much criticism. And then all of a sudden they get to college and that completely changes. So making sure that your child deals with criticism in, um, in a way that's not going to be upsetting and crosses over the line to be rude. Flexibility. I talked a little bit earlier about letting go. Not everybody's going to agree with you. But also flexibility in um, doing things with peers. So you want to go see a movie and everybody else wants to go see another movie. So are you going to go to the movie by yourself? Or are you going, are you going to go to the movie that everybody else wants to go to? Because you're going to be flexible. And then maybe next time everybody will go to your movie. Having some flexibility can be very important to maintaining friendships in college. Problem solving. What is the plan for when things are not going well? Like I said earlier, I like to be proactive, not reactive. So having a plan in place for when things are not going well. What is the protocol? What are you going to do? Um, the other thing is communication. Many of our kids go off to college and we never hear from them again unless we contact them. So figuring out a way that you are going to communicate with your child. Is it going to be through email? Is it going to be through Facebook? Are you going to call? Is it going to be through Skype? What, how, what's the communication going to look like? And then schedule that in. Maybe putting that on the big um, schedule for the semester the semester at a glance. Every Sunday at 7, your student's going to Skype you or call you. But having some sort of way that your student's going to get in touch with you on a regular basis. Basic skills. So study habits. What are the study habits that your child has? Um, what type of test taking skills do they have? Are they able to take notes? Or are they going to need to tape record the lectures? Or are they going to need to get their notes from somebody else? What about reading? We know in college that it's probably impossible to read every single word, that you're going to have to learn to skim because the amount of pages that you have to read for every subject is overwhelming. So learning how to skim and getting the information that you need so you can be successful. Advocating with professors, TAs, peers, administration, very important. Being prepared, keeping up with assignments. Um, group projects can often be the downfall of our students. If you do have, if your student does have a group project, how are they going to avoid having a problem or an issue with the group? Doing some um, group projects in high school is good preparation. And then timeliness with homework, with assignments, with projects. All very, very important. More basic skills. Organization. Organization could often be a problem for some of our kids. So ahead of time, being proactive, not reactive. Where is your work study area? Are you going to work in your room or are you going to go to the library? If you have roommates, maybe working in your room isn't going to um, be the perfect place maybe working in the library, maybe having a set time that you go to the library every single day. So maybe you have morning classes from 8 to 10 and you don't have another class till 2. So from 10 to 2, you're go that's going to be your li library time. Making sure that you're keeping up with deadline deadlines using that semester at a glance and then um, your work needs to be neat when it's passed in. Classroom etiquette is very important. You don't want to have too much or too little. You want to be just like Goldilocks. It wants to be just right. So what I mean by that is you're not going to um, answer every question or you're not going to answer no questions, but somewhere in the middle there. Um, we know that, that our students are very bright and very intelligent, but I can tell you that correcting the professor is probably not a good thing to do, especially in front of the other students. Professors aren't going to like that, and um, they're not going to look uh, fondly at you for um, correcting them. So making sure that if you are going to 
correct a professor, professor. Maybe you make an appointment at their um, in their office hours and you let them know behind closed doors. Um, making disruptions or loud noises or eating. I talked about that earlier. Making sure that's under control a little bit. Um, are they going to use campus transportation to get around? Is the campus that big that they need to use public trans uh, some sort of public transportation? Or is the, is the campus small and they're going to walk? Either way, leaving enough time to get to class on time. So if class is at 11 o'clock and it takes you 15 minutes to walk, you can't leave it five minutes off because you're going to be late. So understanding that time management piece. And then that leisure time, okay? How much time are you going to spend on video games, on sleep, on eating? I have navigating the DC, which is the dining commons. It might take you a lot longer when you get there to eat because it's confusing. Maybe there's lots of different stations. There's lots of smells. Who do you sit with? So it may take a while to navigate the dining commons. Um, the video game one is really important. If your kid is one of those kiddos that plays all the time, all hours. So how is that going to fit into college where it's different from high school? Now remember high school, you go to school from you know like 7.30 in the morning till 2.30 in the afternoon and then maybe you have a couple of hours homework. But all that whole day you're scheduled in classes. Well college is like the opposite. You might have a class you know from 8 to 9.30, you might have another class at 2 in the afternoon, you might even have another class in the evening. So what are you going to do with all that free time? Are you going to play video games? Are you going to study? Are you going to eat? What are you going to do during all that free time? So preparation. We know that preparation begins with that transition plan. I suggest after today's talk, you look at your child's transition plan and see if it's robust enough and it makes sense. Um, this plan involves the school, the families, and we can't forget about the student. So if you have a transition plan in place and you have never asked the student what they would like on that transition plan or if the student hasn't seen the transition plan, that's important. The student needs to be involved. Remembering that there's many colleges to choose, choose from, small, medium, and large, and um, making sure that you visit a variety of colleges. This planning, I'm not even... I don't even want to say may take longer than typically developing peers. It will take longer than typical developing peers. And that's okay. And that understanding, that self-understanding and self-advocacy skills are absolutely necessary to have some level of success in college. So some decisions to be made, okay? Is your child going to disclose? Who are they going to disclose to? Well, if they're going to get help from the Office of Disabilities, they need to disclose there. Are they going to disclose the counseling services because maybe they need meds um, renewed? Or maybe they feel like um, they suffer from depression or, or anxiety on a fairly regular basis and they're going to need to talk to somebody so that it's going to disclose the counseling services in case they need an appointment. Are you going to let professors know? What about RAs, the ones on the dorms? These are all questions to answer before you go off to college. Um, are you, um, is your student going to have a full schedule? Or are they going to have a reduced schedule? What's going to make more sense? When was the last neuropsych evaluation? Making sure that uh, your, your child understands their strengths and challenges and has good self-advocacy skills. Um, I'll read you this little comment. It says, I want greater self-awareness, but can I continue to be unaware of my bad qualities? So self-awareness begins before college. These are some of the things that I suggest. Having a vision statement. Um, and I would suggest a, a student does this in their maybe freshman and so or sophomore year. What do you see yourself doing in life? Are you going to go to college or maybe you should go um, train with somebody and maybe college isn't going to be the right thing. Maybe you're going to do an apprenticeship instead. And that the understanding of careers matching interest. That maybe your interest is, um, let's see, 
some sort of the influence of art on ancient Rome. Well, what are you going to do with that? That's your interest. You might even be able to take some college, college classes. You might be able to even have a major in that. But how is that going to lead to a career? Um, understanding about self-regulation and self-care. So having some level of the ability to think about others. So that's that perspective taking, theory of mind. Um, many of our students have difficulty with this, so this might be hard. Will my behavior disturb others? If I have a misunderstanding, how do I have a conversation and um, apologize? Or how can I have a conversation to find out what went wrong? These are things that are important. Impulse control and impulsivity. What do I do to calm myself down? to re-regulate. Same with sensory issues. And then one of the bigger ones that I talked about earlier is hygiene. Is, is my students or my child's hygiene pretty um, you know pretty much like the regular like their typical peers. Time management. What's your um, method for time management? Do you use your watch? Do you use a calendar? Do you use your phone? Do you use your iPad? Do you use your computer? So having a method of time management and seeing how that works for you. Um, remembering that there's a college for everyone. If you really discourage that, oh my goodness, this is overwhelming. I don't know if my child's going to college. I don't even know if there's a college for them. There is a college for everyone. So in thinking about this and talking with your ASD child, Will your student apply to colleges with a dedicated AS program? Like I said before, um, Lori Wolf and Jane Theofield Brown have a website and they have some dedicated AS programs listed right on their website. And oftentimes these programs may come with a little bit higher cost, but you can also be rest assured that the um, work that they're doing with your student is going to be more specific and catered to your student. And also, schools with a dedicated AS program are more likely to communicate with parents. Is the student ready for all core subjects? Has the student taken the language? And is the student willing to continue the language requirement in college? These are all good questions to ask. Is a large, a medium, or a small school right? And once you start visiting, you'll be able to answer some of these questions. Are there clubs or classes pertaining to the student's special interest at the university or school? That might be a good thing. If your student has such a strong special interest, it might be a good thing to check on some clubs or um, classes with that special interest. And is the student willing to go to a smaller community college and then transferring to a larger institution? That might be um, the best thing for many of our students. It gives them two years to really mature and to take college classes, and then they can go to a four-year school. So just to give you an idea, does anybody know where Barack Obama went to school? Because a lot of people say Harvard or Columbia undergrad. Actually, Barack Obama went to Occidental in California. That's the first school that he went to. Not sure if he went there for a year or two, but then he transferred to Columbia. So it doesn't really matter where your kid goes to school first. It matters where, it probably matters more where they graduate from. So going to a small, um, lesser known college might work out for the first couple of years for your student or your child. So colleges and universities. Um, provide equal access to facilities, programs, and activities to all students. They offer reasonable accommodations. They uphold student confidentiality. That's important. It's, an, it's also important for your child to know as well. And they establish policies and procedures for students with disabilities, including grievance. So if something happens at college and your student is upset about that, they often have a grievance procedure that can be followed so your um, child can get some satisfaction. 
college students, remember, must be able to attend classes, complete the required assignments, maintain appropriate behavior, able to self-advocate, get accepted to college on, on their own merit, and show functional impact of the disability. So if your student is um, wanting some level of services, they have to be able to um, show that they need that accommodation, and without it, they won't be as successful. So I'm going to show you another video um, about a college student, and um, I'd like you to watch it and think about how um, things are going for the student and how he is able to be successful. Internet edition of Nightline, I'm Martin Bashir. Adolescence is normally a challenging time of life, but imagine growing up with Asperger's syndrome. Although this variant of autism was first identified more than 60 years ago, it still remains a mystery to many. And that means that life can be particularly tough for those with the condition. Here's Nightline's John Donver. <laughs> It's about perfect to sing in a choir. If the thing you've missed in life is the simple pleasure of fitting in, as long as you can follow the notes, no one can pick you out as the different one. Nice and shiny, the odd one, as long as the music plays, as long as the music plays. But what happens after that? I'm going to explain this to the entire group, okay? Well, if you are Daniel Corcoran, a sophomore at Ramapo College in Mawa, New Jersey, you take the daring step, maybe the dangerous step, of coming out, as he puts it. I have a condition for my, that I've had like my entire life, always will have it. As a man with Asperger's syndrome. It's about autism and Asperger's, and I have Asperger's syndrome. Melissa and Val, right? I have Asperger's syndrome. About the fact that he is different in a way that he can never change. But I just wanted to go around a little bit, get, get them a view of me and stuff. You're telling a lot of people today, really am, today yeah. that you have Asperger's. And, and what do you want them to do with I'm that? I'm willing to take this risk, honestly. I'm not afraid to tell people anymore what it is I have. What do you want them to do with that knowledge? I want them to be further educated and to, to know for future reference, don't mess with people just because they're a little different. Maybe they can't help it. Maybe they were just born that way. Okay, now here we go. Past First, past the backstory, because chances are you'll recognize some of the details. Daniel Cochran growing up was that kid you knew in school who was, well, a little odd. Not slow. In fact, likely the opposite. He might be great at math or computers or baseball stats, but he'd be no good at sports himself because his coordination was off. And he tended to get stuck on certain subjects obsessively. For Daniel, it was fluorescent lighting of all things. The second you flip the switch, bingo, it's on. And then he couldn't let go of it. It's called 32 watt T8 fluorescent lamp. And or as his mom remembers it. He told me he wanted to be a street light for Halloween and I said, you're on your own with this one. I have no clue. And he just, we got a shoebox, and he went out and he bought colored gels, and he rigged up this thing, and darned if he wasn't a streetlight for Halloween that year. All right, left turn. All right. One final thing you might recall about that kid who was like Daniel, when you all hit middle school, the scorched earth zone of American childhood, his life became a social nightmare. There was a bully, and he began taunting and teasing and and actually physically pushing Daniel into the wall. Well, I got a lot of different names like Big Nose Freak, Loser. One day he came home, his shirt was ripped. One day his head was a little bloody. Calling me a retard. Oh, it doesn't feel so good as a parent when your kid comes home and says, so-and-so called me a retard. Pretty nasty names for a disability because that's what Daniel has. Asperger's with its odd behaviors and obsessions is a form of autism that somehow brings out a mean streak in those who don't know any better. I'm big into Star Wars too. 
Really? Yeah. Are yeah. they making a seven eight nine? They are? Yep. Just sure. ask Noah Orrett, a 12-year-old who wouldn't hurt a yeah, fly. You can see that. You can also see that he's quirky. Do you have one, two, three, four, five, six? Uh -huh. All of them? Uh -huh. On DVD? Uh -huh. Oh, man, you're lucky. Uh -huh. And he paid for it in the fifth grade. There were a few kids that didn't like me. And they were calling you names? Yeah. Were they, were they hurting you physically? No, they were just did the regular stuff. Like? Gestures or and calling me names. What did you do? Did you say anything? No. I didn't. You just took it quietly? Yep. Just heard inside? Yep. I mean, after that, my life would never be the same. In some areas, you know, uh, there have been reports of 90% of kids with Asperger's are getting bullied on a daily basis. 90%? Jed Baker is a psychologist who consults for the Milburn, New Jersey Middle School, which tries to make it work for kids with conditions like Asperger's, kids like Noah, and also Eli, who is 12. How does Asperger's work? How does it make you different? There's something in my brain that makes me think different than other people. But it is nothing, okay? Don't worry about it. Yeah. I think when I first saw him early in elementary school, really didn't have friends then, and had a really hard time connecting and a, a real hard time attending too. He just was not tuned into anyone else's conversation. You found out what she has yet? What do you have? It's the sort of skill that Baker is teaching at Milburn in sessions where he pairs kids with Aspergers with volunteers from the student body who become practice partners in just talking. So, no, what are you doing over the weekend? No, nothing. Oh. Are you not, are you going? oh, we're going to see where you are. Tell me about what was happening there. What were you learning there? I was learning about basically just how to make friends and stuff. I mean, in my old school, I never had many friends. I was just merely called Game Boy Freak or stuff. Game Boy Freak? Yeah. Oh. I mean, but there was one kid who was the worst. What did he do to you? He just called me names, and he was not nice. He was mean. Mean to the bone. Really? Yep. I just was so mad, I just couldn't let out my anger. I was just, just like, hiding it. In fact, kids compete to be accepted as partners in the program, and that has had a huge effect on kids' attitudes toward the disabled in this school. So working with what were once called the uncool kids yeah. has become a cool thing to do. Yeah. Well, you know what? <laughs> In short, Noah and Eli, they don't get picked on here. They told me that themselves. They actually have friends. This is a really different place, isn't it? I know. I'm having a lot of friends. I like the school, the staff, even Dr. Baker. <laughs> and what about Daniel Corcoran, that college student for whom middle school is now years in the past? I couldn't be happier, you know. All right, go on. You couldn't be happier. Wait, I have to stop because that's really important. I couldn't just... be happier than I am now. I haven't felt like in this amazing frame of mind since who knows when. Being at this school has helped. It's like all dreams start to come true. We would soon learn that Daniel was having a very good day when he said this, but that he has also had bad days, like the rest of us, only... Not really like the rest of us. Hey. Hi. <laughs> he had grown up in so many ways. What are you doing? Yes, sir. We would hear when he had lunch with the guy he dorms with, the conversation. I don't know. It happens. Sometimes girls say no. Real conversation is a skill he has finally learned after years of working at it. I don't know. It's like I'm too nervous to try to overcome their objection. But actually, romance is now what perplexes Daniel as much as bullies once tormented him. I guess the biggest weakness of having Asperger's for my whole life has been, has just been being able to talk to people. It's again. something he's now trying to learn. I will notice if something is not exactly right about the conversation. I'll notice if it's not a smooth mesh. What will you do if it's not? Nowadays, what I try to do is say, see you later. Like if she doesn't smile back at me, you know, if she just doesn't seem into the conversation, I'll just know to back away. I'm sure everybody has told you from your father to counselors to friends that everybody has trouble talking to women. I'm sure they've told Multiply you. Multiply it by about 50 and getting smaller though, 
that's how hard it is for me. Yeah, I'm eating my snack. No, it's not. It's cold. It's okay. Even at Ramapo, a college dedicated to helping students with disabilities make it, the girl issue is complicated for Daniel. Some of them have been put off by his assertive declaration that he has Asperger's. He oversteps at times, but that's Asperger's. And all Daniel wants is to figure out how to live with it. As long as I stay on my ground and I am who I'm supposed to be, you know what? Others are really, really, really going to love me too. I really do think some people are going to like me, and, and I'm convinced I'm going to meet somebody really special someday. I think you will too. Thank you. And if Daniel can picture that day, so can those who have known him all his life and know how much he wants what everyone else has. I think there are a lot of people who believe that anyone on the spectrum doesn't have the range of emotions that your average person has, and I beg to differ. I think it's all there. It may be a lot more difficult for them to express. But, excuse me, but it's all there. <clears throat> Getting choked up here. Fitting in while standing out. It isn't always easy for anyone, but some of us just have to work harder to get there. I'm John Donvan for Nightline in Mawa, New Jersey. Surviving adolescence. So that gave you a little bit of a picture of a um, student in college, uh, which sometimes, you know, it's nice to see that, um, that picture. And so just some, some talking points to think about. What kind of Asperger's characteristics did he have? How was he able to negotiate college? Um, and um, is he being successful? So just some things to think about. So let's talk about what let's kind of talk about what universities and colleges can do. Okay, we're kind of reviewing here. They can provide services through disability and counseling offices. There's tutoring services. Oftentimes, there's peer support, and the study centers often um, are manned by um, upper level students, either graduate students or uh, seniors. There's the campus handbook, and I would suggest that. Um, once your student gets accepted to a college and is going to go there, um, accessing this campus handbook and looking it over with them. They can give you contact information for the professors, the TAs, the health center, etc. Et um, that's all something that's completely um, normal to ask for. Your student can get grades and project updates. There's emergency information available and asking for, a, for reasonable accommodations through the disability office is all things that are, um, that are reasonable to ask for. Now, is there going to be training for staff? Will there be consultations about um, ASD for professors? Each university or college is different. I have done some college training and I know some other people that have done college training. Um, there's been some consultations about students with ASD. Is this normal? Probably not that normal. Um, but I think that we're coming to an age where more and more of this is happening. This is a little bit of a checklist. Thinking about your family and um, how far away should your student go to college? Should they go to college right away or should they go to community college? Can they take classes in high school so they're a little bit ahead of the game? So thinking about your family, thinking about the school, um, and then developing a transition checklist, working with schools and families, and let's not forget the student, to develop a transition checklist. Um, and if you already have a transition plan, going back and looking at that transition plan and seeing if you need to add anything or seeing if you're happy with, with it. So some considerations, full-time versus part-time. You know, we can always, you can always go to college part-time and work part-time. Um, college, community college versus four-year institution, we've talked about that. Is your student going to have a roommate 
or in these days oftentimes there's um, two or three or four roommates. A lot of schools now are making uh, rooms that used to be doubles, triples, and there's a lot of quads, there's like mini apartments, there's all kinds of different rooming type situations. So deciding what's going to be best for, uh, for your child. Are they going to register with the Disability Services Department? That's a big one. Another thing that we didn't talk about is taking courses in summer. So one of the ways that if your child is going to go to a four-year institution and they want to graduate on time is taking one less class each semester. So if the class load is five, they're going to take four. If the class load is four, they're going to take three. And then taking a class or two every summer. And then you're still able to graduate on time. The benefit of taking a course in summer is oftentimes the classes are small. The professors are very um, easy to uh, talk to. The class is a little bit more informal. And so taking some classes in summer might be a good thing to put into the mix. Accommodation. What works for you or your child? What's reasonable to ask for? Um, what type of parent involvement will there be? You can certainly sign the FERPA. I forget what uh, FERPA stands for, but it's the parental signature that the college has the um, opportunity to contact you if they so desire to use it. I don't want you to think that just because you sign the FERPA that the college or university is going to call you if something's happening. They may or they may not. Is your child going to come home? How often are you going to go visit them? Um, how is your uh, child going to man manage anxiety? Or I should say manage anxiety and, and or depression. Are they, going to, are they going to have somebody at the counseling services that they check in with on a regular basis? Is there going to be some sort of go-to person that checks in with them on a regular basis just to make sure they're doing okay? What's the med, med management situation? Are they going to be taking meds when they're in college? How are they going to be filled? Where are they going to be kept? All things to think about. Some other considerations. Um, does your child accept and understand their diagnosis? Do they understand and um, accept their strengths and challenges? Are they able to advocate for themselves? in a socially responsible manner. So advocating for yourself is not being demanding. It's not barging in. It's not screaming at people. It's being able to self to advocate for yourself in a socially responsible manner. Does your child or your student have self-acceptance about who they are? We're not trying to change people with Asperger's or ASD. We're trying to help them and support them so they can be successful in our society. Do they understand their available resources and they know how to access these resources, whether it's counseling, tutoring, advising, um, talking to the professor, going to disability services, do they understand how to access these services? Being aware that colleges and universities have codes of conduct and understanding what violates those codes of conduct and what can happen, what are some of the repercussions Cushions that can happen if you um, don't follow these codes of conduct. The ability to no negotiate, compromise, let go. So sometimes um, you're just going to have to agree to disagree or do something that somebody else wants to do that you don't really want to do. Because what we know as typical people, we do that all the time. You know, somebody wants to go see a movie or they want to go to a restaurant that you don't necessarily want to go to, but because you're doing something with them, you compromise and you do this, you do what they want to do this time. So maybe next time they'll do what you want to do. Dealing appropriately with members of the opposite sex, that can be um, really important because that can lead to some problems. Understanding emergency procedures. So if you're not feeling well or if you're feeling that things are going downhill fast, who's your go-to person? Who are you going to call? Do you know when to use 911, when it's inappropriate to use 911? Will you hire a coach for your student? Will your student ha have a coach during their college years to help them negotiate and be successful in college? 
Um, I'll read you this little cartoon. It says, that's part of our in-house stress management program. It says, scream room occupied. Um, so some other considerations, and these are all managing, you know, um, is your child have good time management skills, money management, transportation management, so that's driving or taking public transportation, social anxiety management. Are they able to set goals and understand the process and the steps that you need to take to achieve them? Uh, understanding relationships, peer relationships and relationships with people of the opposite sex. Are they able to manage conflict when they disagree with somebody? Are they able to calm down and not get so um, emotionally dysregulated when people disagree with them? And stress management. What do they have for strategies to uh, manage stress? So what's most important? Self-advocacy. Talked a lot about that. Absolutely key. And I would suggest starting using those self-advocacy skills in high school. Understanding strengths and challenges. Understanding your diagnosis. One or two away from home experiences. I can't stress that one enough either. Because when you're away from home, things can be very different. The noises can be different, the smells, the feel of the bed, everything. So learning to deal with not sleeping at home is very important. Assessments in high school. So the neuropsych we talked about, but there's also technology assessments, sensory assessments. Are those necessary? And a plan for when things are not going well. So when things are going well, that's fine, but having some sort of plan in place for when things don't go well, having a go-to person, very important. Um, right on AANE's website, they have the wallet card, and I would suggest having this uh, wallet card filled out, filled out and having your student or your child have one. It gives a little bit of uh, an understanding of what Asperger's is, but also some contact information. So if, if your child is in such an agitated state and they're not able to respond when something's happening that um, may be negative, having the wallet card could be a good thing. And um, thanking people because there's a lot of other people who are doing this type of training and I want to thank them because um, everybody working together helps our students be successful in college. So thank you very much and um, I'm available for any questions, Ilya, if people have any. Yes, we do have a couple questions. Thank you so much. Um, and I just wanted to, let's see, follow up. You you mentioned Jane um, Theerfield Brown and uh, Lorraine Wolf, and someone yep. did ask about them. Um, just to cover a couple of the questions, they do present at a and &E a full day's worth of uh, a workshop getting more in depth about the application process, selecting the right school, how to stay in school. Um, so those might be of interest, and um, there will be a date coming up in the spring and the fall is usually how we're trying to schedule it, um, and possibly a webinar. So that uh, is something to look for in the future. They also do consultations at a &E specifically, so we have those two dates coming up um, in the spring as well, and uh, we'll be sending information once we confirm those dates. Um, but also you can go to their website, as Robin mentioned, and that is, um, I'm looking, I'm double checking, it's collegeautismspectrum.com, and they have a lot of information on um, what schools have AS programs, which schools are more um, AS friendly, um, and what have you. So um, they can actually sit and work with you um, specifically on what you know your your child's needs uh, might be and i'm going through this process right now as my son is a junior yeah, and it's want, quite helpful yeah i just want to interject their all day program is really terrific and in fact it actually used to be two days so it's been okay. pared down to one there's so much information this this two hour one that i just gave is a little bit of a taste and it's, it's, right. it sets you off in the right direction but their theirs is much more robust and much more um specific information right Exactly. Um, oh, just uh, to repeat, the website is college autism spectrum, all one word, dot com. 
So uh, a question here. Can you provide any insight as to parent slash student's perspective on considering a community college as a starting option? Can you characterize in your experience parent or student response to community college options? Yeah, I mean, it just depends upon um, depends upon the family dynamics, but I think going to community college for a year or two is a great idea, especially if your student tends to be on the immature side, which a lot of our kids are, let's face it, that's part of the profile of having ASD, is being a little less mature. So it gives them an opportunity to take college classes and to get some maturity under their belt before they go off to college and I would say in the last few years our community college offerings have really um, improved quite a bit. It used to, you know, 20-30 years ago if you thought of going to community college it was considered like not not that great. It's completely changed. The offerings at community colleges are really really terrific and I feel like if people are on the fence they should really go visit their community college. I have visited my local community college a number of times and it's terrific. Um, what are your thoughts on online college classes? Ah, that's a really good one. Uh, I know that our population that we're talking about would love to take online classes. I'm not a huge fan of just online classes because of the um, lack of social interactions. Um, maybe a hybrid online class so where they meet once a month and then everything else is done online and then they go back to meeting once a month but I really feel strongly that the more um, social uh, situations that our kids are put into the better they're going to be at them and the less they do they're not going to have as much time much practice let's face it everything that we get better at is because of practice and it's the same with social relatedness. So if our kids just take online classes and they have no time where they're interacting with other people, they're not going to be able to get good at it. But that's my okay, part. Somebody else might disagree. <laughs> um, as part of the transition plan, is the school district obligated to help the student find colleges or alternative gap slash bridge slash fifth year hybrid pre-college program with appropriate support services or is it all on the family? Well, it just depends upon what your IEP is. Is if your IEP has that extra year, you know, some of our um, IEPs go through 19, 20, 21. So it depends upon your IEP. If your IEP ends at graduation, then know that the, the high school is not obligated to help you do that. And I, I'll be honest with you, there's not a lot of gap year programs out there that I would highly recommend. First of all, many of the gap year programs only last a very short amount of time. So the gap year programs you might have to do you know two or three or four of them to get a whole year's worth of gap year programming there are a couple out there but um, I suggest visiting them um, and being very careful about that and I from what I have seen there hasn't been a lot of high schools that have helped with gap year you know I um, I dread saying this but most of our high schools call um, um, guidance departments are made up of people helping kids get into college and that doesn't mean kids with special needs or disabilities and our high school uh, uh, guidance staff doesn't have a lot of information about what college is going to be the right fit for your kid so I do think as a family you have to do your homework. Uh, another question, are you aware of any community colleges in New England that offer a specific program of services or experiences for ASD students beyond just typical disability accommodations? Yes. Um, what is the one that Corrine Ritchie works, off, works at? Which one is that? Um, I'm going to just talk, have it here. I have it here in my notes. So hold on. Um, it is... Uh, Middlesex Community College has um, specific help for kids with ASD and Corrine Ritchie used to be the head of the Disability Support Services. She may not be anymore, I don't know, but I know that Middlesex Community has worked really hard to support the ASD community. Um, and so far, our last question, um, do, we, do we just request that the transition be added to the IEP through the IEP meeting? There should be a place in the um, IEP document for transition planning. 
should be right in there because it's it's a it's a legal responsibility. But oftentimes, what it is, it's just a little block with a couple of sentences. And what I suggest families do is create a transition plan with maybe the case manager and somebody from guidance, and then you add that in as a, as a as an extra document to the IEP. Right, and uh, if. If uh, you have more questions around transition, um, you can, of, call, of course, call us at A&E, but we do have uh, some on-demand videos that you can watch at your, you know, at your preference, time preference, um, about how to create a really good transition plan with your, you know, with your child and the school. So um, if you need more information on that, you can contact me as well. Um, and let's see. One more. What type of special services can high school students use outside uh, provided by the school through like that you can hire? I'm not really clear on the question. Oh, but. so you mean like like the life map for high school? Like so that maybe. type of thing, maybe? I mean, um, you can do you can hire a, um, an ASD coach. I don't know. Life Map is doing some high school stuff, and I've right. worked with some high school kids. But you can definitely hire somebody um, to help your kid with that whole um, transition into college to talk about you know what college dorms are going to be like, what kind of the peer pressure is going to be, what type of colleges that may um, work well with their personality. Um, but as far as um, hiring a life map coach, you'd have to go through life map and talk to them what they have for specific high school um, kind of. Oh, okay, so, so, so she further clarified. Okay. Um, People that will consult with you about finding appropriate colleges, what are they called? I think, um, I'm thinking they're just generally called coaches. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, even if you were to call um, Lorraine, um, and, and Jane probably allows for more time in her schedule to coach, she does it via Skype all over the country. So, um, you know, physical proximity isn't an issue anymore. And um, it's not like you commit to a certain number of meetings anymore. The way she's, uh, the way she sets it up through A&E is you meet a one time and from there you can, she gives you tons of information that you can use right at that point. And then if it makes sense, maybe meet another time or meet later on, depending on where you are in right. the process so and it's very individual thing, and I do that sort of thing too Ilya where I okay. do some, yep. some coaching I, I know I'm up in New Hampshire but um, a lot of people have this as a, we've realized that we need to do this as a sideline because we do these workshops and people have more questions and they're more specific and they're more related to their particular child so it's kind of worked out that way for a lot of us Great. So now I can uh, I can refer with you too. <laughs> Absolutely. Yep. Well, I think we're right uh, just at, at 12, a little past. So um, I'd like to thank everyone for attending. And again, if you have any questions, you can feel free to contact me. Um, I think Robin gave you her contact information as well, um, or a anyone at A&E uh, Child and Teen Services, and we'll be able to point you in the right direction. So thank you all so much. And you will receive um, a link to an evaluation um, and the material. So um, I hope to see you in another program. Thank you so much. Thanks, Ilya. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.